The Spartan people under Lycurgus. The men, forced to leave their houses to be soldiers, left the family estate under the sole control of their wives. Because of this, they treated them with more respect than any other Greeks paid their wives. Lycurgus gave considerable thought and attention to the role of women. He told them to run outdoors, to learn to wrestle, and play sports, as he believed that strong women made strong mothers. He forbade women to marry at young ages, but asked them to wait until they had grown into full maturity so that they may better endure and survive the pain and dangers of childbirth. He freed them from the softness and feigned weaknesses that other Greeks expected of women. At festivals, the girls would dance and sing, and they took it as their duty to mock the boys who failed to demonstrate enough courage or achievement. They would, if they chose to, sing praises of those who had uh, shown themselves to be worthy of it. The effect of the insults and the praise gained immense power from the fact that they were sung in front of all of the Spartans, so that the kings and the citizens all heard and all knew of the boys' particular deeds. Lycurgus also returned to the women of Sparta a place for their bravery and ambition. The Queen Gorgo was once appro approached by a foreign woman, who said to her, You Spartan women seem to be the only ones who rule their men. To which Queen Gorgo famously answered, Yes, we are the only ones who give birth to men. Lycurgus took, it, uh, took the upbringing of children to be his most important task, and so he thought carefully about how best to raise Spartans from birth to be the greatest soldiers on earth. Children in Sparta were no longer under the control of their fathers, but rather that of the government. When a child was born, the elders examined them. If the child proved strong, they told the parents to raise them and assigned the baby one of the 9,000 lots of land divided up by Lycurgus for the Spartans. If the child revealed weakness or deformity, they left it at the ba uh, chasm at the base of Mount Tegetus. In Sparta, there was no room for those who could not fight or bear strong children, and no effort could be spared in raising them. Life for Spartans was built around strength and endurance, and from birth the state hardened them against pain, tempered them to it, like good steel in a forge fire. Mothers would bathe their newborns in wine instead of water to test their ability to withstand pain. The nurses and nannies of Sparta helped raise the babies to be strong and hard. They taught them not to be afraid of the dark, to never complain about their food, and to never show tears or weakness. This is the reason why so many other Greeks sought out Spartan nurses for their own children. In Sparta, a father could not raise his son however he pleased, for Lycurgus had created laws to govern this sort of thing. As soon as a boy turned seven, Lycurgus ordered that he join the Agoge. There he was placed with other boys his age and they were all taught together. The boy who showed himself to be the most courageous and to possess the best judgment was made captain, and the other boys had to obey his orders. The boys learned the basics of reading and writing, but the majority of their training uh, taught them to obey commands, to endure hardships, and to win in battle. As they grew older and tougher, the difficulty of the trials increased. increased. Their heads were shaved, their shoes were taken away, and when they turned twelve, the only clothing they were permitted was a single red cloak. Their skin became hard and dry, and they learned to ignore the cold. At night, the only beds they knew were beds they made themselves from rushes and other plants they had collected by hand. Command of the boys' training fell to men called errands, who were two years out of training themselves. If the boys were caught stealing, the errands would beat them soundly, not for stealing, but for being stupid enough to get caught. Stealing was a necessity for the boys, as they were barely issued enough food to get by, and never enough to become full. So the young Spartans learned to sneak, and steal, and ambush, and were forced to become bold and cunning. The, foi the boys also ate with the Phaedetia, and treated them with the seriousness of students in a class, for indeed they were being taught important lessons. Over dinner, they listened to the men discussing politics, and there they learned to trade arguments and meet teasing insults with courage. If any boy felt that he could not endure the teasing or the jokes any longer, all he had to do was say, Stop! And the men would cease instantly. When a boy was ready, he would ask to join a Phaedetia, and they would vote on him. If even a single member refused, the boy was denied, since the Phaedetia required complete agreement. After dining, the Spartans traveled home in the dark without any torches to light their way, for use of any light source was forbidden by law. True Spartans held no fear of the dark, and could march boldly through the night from long years of practice. After dinner, the Aaron would question the boys, one at a time, asking them questions that required careful answers. Questions like, who is the best man in all of Sparta? Or, what do you think of this man's actions? In this way, the boys would become used to judging the actions of citizens. If a boy did not have a thoughtful answer with careful reason, he was judged to be weak of spirit, and the Aaron would punish him by biting the boy's thumb. 
Oftentimes, the Spartan elders would watch the Aaron's punishment of the boys. They never said or did anything while it was happening, but later they would call the Aaron to account and punish him for being either too harsh or for not being harsh enough. The boys were also taught to speak with few words. Sparta's money took up lots of space, but was worth little, while their words took up little space, but was worth a lot. The Spartans believed that a wise man knew not only how to speak, but also when to speak. A wise man spoke because he had something to say, but a fool spoke because he had to say something. Greek history is filled with the terse responses of Spartans. From these laconic remarks, it is said that a Spartan's love of wisdom, not their love of physical training, defined their character. The training for Spartans lasted until they reached 20 years of age. No man was allowed to live as they wished, but instead they lived with their spear brothers. A man under the age of 30 had no business in the marketplace and was forbidden to go at all. Hunting, training, and religious festivals took up all the time a Spartan had when he was not out fighting. Like bees working for a queen in the hive, the Spartans dedicated themselves for the good of Sparta. A Spartan lived not for his own pleasure, but for the good of the polis. Once, when a Spartan named Pydartius was told that he was not among the hundred best or 300 best men, he was said to have laughed and smiled, rejoicing that Sparta had 300 better men than he. Spartan Battle Customs before the Spartans went into battle, the king would sacrifice to the muses, reminding his men of their training and invoking the muses to take note of the martial deeds about to be performed and worthy of recording. The Spartans wore their hair long when they became men. They took particular trouble to keep it combed and well kept during times of war. Like Kyrgyz said, that it made a handsome man more handsome and an ugly man terrifying. Not terrifying? Terrifying. When the Spartans defeated an enemy, they did not chase them far. They thought it was dishonorable for a Greek to kill a man once he had stopped fighting. This policy was not only noble, but clever and useful because their enemies broke faster, knowing they could escape the danger all the more quickly by running sooner. Another of Lycurgus's decrees forbade the Spartans from going to war frequently with the same enemies. If Sparta marched year after year against the same people, they would force them to build fortresses and become warlike in response. Centuries later, as the Spartan warrior Antalcidas uh, uh, sorry, one second, Antalcidas watched King Agisthalaeus bleed in the fields outside the city of Thebes. He said, "This is the reward you deserve for teaching the Thebans the Spartan art of war when they did not wish to or even know how." The darker side of Lycurgus's loss. We have all heard about the good things that Lycurgus brought to Sparta to increase the virtue and the righteousness of its people, but attention must be brought to the so-called cryptea, or the secret police, of the Spartans. The government would, from time to time, send out its young warriors, equipped with a dagger and little else. They were charged with maintaining order by use of brutal violence. During the daytime they hid secretly, but at night they would move silently and kill any helot they found outside. Sometimes they challenged the largest helot they could find and slew them in duels. The ephors, or government officials, declared war on the helots each year to make the murders by the cryptea legal in the eyes of the gods. Indeed, the treatment of the helots was crueler and harsher than in any other place in all of Greece. The saying went that in Sparta, the freeman is more free than anywhere else in the world, and the slave is more a slave. Lycurgus forbade the Spartans from living abroad or visiting other places for fun, for he worried that they would bring back bad habits and foreign ideas about the government. Lycurgus, Lycurgus banished all non-essential foreigners from Sparta to stop their foreign ideas from, uh, from spreading. Lycurgus feared the corruption of the Spartan ways and sought, uh, sought to keep new ideas out of Sparta in the same way that we might try to keep infectious diseases out of our country. The Death and Legacy of Lycurgus Lycurgus ordered that none of his laws should be written down, as no law should be immune to changes if the people needed to adapt them. He left the job of protecting his laws in the hands of the wisest men of Sparta, and they guarded them carefully. And when all of his laws had been firmly established, and the new system had grown strong enough to support itself, Lycurgus was filled with joy and satisfaction. He desired to make his system immortal, and to keep it for all future generations of men. To ensure this, he formed his last clever plan. He called all of the people together and said that he had one last change to make, but that before he could do it, he needed to consult with the oracle at Delphi once more. He made the people swear to keep his rules until he came back, and after receiving the oath, 
from each and every citizen of Sparta. He set out on his journey. When he arrived at the oracle, he sacrificed to the gods and asked if his laws were good and if they would ensure the success of his people. The oracle answered that the laws were good and that while his people held to them, they would be held in turn in the highest of honor. Lycurgus had this answer written down and sent back to Sparta. But for himself, Lycurgus uh, resolved never to return and release the people from their oath. He was old and he had reached the point where death held no fear for him. He swore to make his final act the ultimate sacrifice for his polis and refused all food until he died. His death secured the laws, for since he never returned, the people could never undo his laws. His friends had his body burned and his ashes scattered so that uh, no one could carry his bones back and claim to release the Spartans of their oath that way. While Lycurgus' laws remained in force, Sparta brought much good to the city-states of Greece. Like Hercules, who according to the myths traveled around Greece defeating wicked men, Sparta sent men to topple tyrants and restore the laws of the polis. Often a single Spartan with his red cloak was enough to pull down illegal tyrannies, judge disputes, and lead the righteous men to victory. The Greeks sent to Sparta when they needed help, sometimes for soldiers, but more often for a single man to command them. When the Spartan commander arrived, he was treated with honor. Perhaps the greatest argument in favor of Lycurgus's laws come from a comparison of Sparta to its neighbors. Before Lycurgus, the cities of Messenia and Argos were equally powerful, and perhaps even more powerful as they held better farmland. But soon after, they both fell to fighting among their own people and were eclipsed by the growing power and virtue of Sparta. <laughs>